things that we have in life and everything, it's hard to say, Lord, thank you for this. But we can always come to him and say, Lord, thank you through this. As we know that he's there to, to be with us in everything. Holidays can be such a great blessing to many of us, and they can be such a difficult time for others. And yet, when our focus is as it should be in these holy days, if we want to call them that, on Jesus Christ, it's easy to get through both and glorify his name. All right, let's open our Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's pray before we dive in here. Father, we come to you this morning, and we do just that. Lord, we give you thanks. Thanks for all that you've done, Lord. First of all, for our salvation. Where would we be without that? That you gave your life on that cross for our sins, that we might have life in you, Lord Jesus. We give you thanks for that. Lord, we pray this morning, as always, Lord, that as we open your word, that your word would open us, that you search our hearts, Lord Jesus that you cleanse us, that you purify us. Lord, that you would teach us. And then as we go, Lord, that you would use us in a way that glorifies you, Lord. And in your name we pray, amen. All right, as we've been going through Paul's letter to the church here at Corinth, so far he's pretty much been dealing with the, the strife and the division and dissension that's going on in the church. How they were behaving carnally, like mere humans looking at the things and looking at things from a fleshly perspective. And he says, get your eyes, basically, he says, get your eyes on Jesus and focus on him. He's the one that's doing the work. He's the one that brings the gain. He's the one that's growing the church. It's not Paul. It's not Apollos. It's not Cephas. It's not a person. And it's not them that you should be glorifying, but the work of the Lord and this division and stuff that came from that. Which, by the way, if you go and you look at some of the apostolic fathers, they dealt with this issue here about 40, 50 years later again. But after Paul was already gone. So, but it comes up. It comes up. It's easy for us living in this world to get our eyes on the things of this world and try to see the things of the Lord from a worldly perspective. And we ought not do that. It's to keep our eyes on Him. Paul says that he was writing these to them as beloved children, not to shame them. And that's one of the things that that we are grateful for, the grace and the mercy of the Lord, that even when we as his children are wrong, he doesn't come to shame us. He may be to correct us. There may be a need for a chastening sometimes in our lives, but the purpose is never to shame us, but to teach us and to grow us up, to build us up, to exhort us. He goes on and tells them that, you know, Paul's there, been there looking after them as a father would. And, everything. and then uh, verse 21, I like that. He says, what, what do you want? Shall I come to you with the rod or in love and the spirit of gentleness? Like, do I need to come over there and straighten you guys out? Or can I just come and, and teach you? Does this have to be a corrective thing or can it be an instructive thing? thing and the lord's desire is is to bring, have us in that place where he can instruct us and paul will go from from that talking about the dissension and the division and all that to some of the things that apparently the church at corinth had questions about well what do we do with this he goes into that and chapter five is talking about some sexual immorality and how to deal with that with with believers that aren't walking the walk that they ought to and it's Pretty interesting here. So let's look at chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this, who has done this deed, might be taken away from among you. For I, indeed, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, 
have already judged, as though I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincere of sincerely, sincerity and truth. Paul addresses an issue that's going on, one of sexual immorality, where the, apparently this guy is sleeping with his stepmother, would be the case. And Paul this, this says this is not just sexual immorality, but it's stuff that's not even heard of among the Gentiles. Even they didn't do that. Yeah? And it's pretty bad when stuff creeps into the church that the people out there that aren't saved, the Gentiles, the unbelievers, that well, we wouldn't, you wouldn't catch us doing that. And Paul's having to deal with this. Even the unbelievers, even the pagan believers, all the were out there, and they were seeing what was going on in this church at Corinth with this situation, going, man, can you believe those guys? We've all had situations in our life and our life lives where we've seen people who called themselves Christians and we looked at what they were doing and went, wow, really? I look, remember back to before I was saved and some of the stuff I saw. Of course, when the only Christians you hang around are down at the bar, you might catch some of this, but you know, not a good thing. You look at that and an unbeliever sees that and, and, and can't believe. There's a, one of the DC Talk albums where they say, you know, one of the the biggest cause of atheism in, in the world is Christians who confess Jesus with their mouth but deny him with their life. Why would I want to follow that? Why would I want to be involved with that? And here he says, you've got this going on, this sexual immorality in Deuteronomy. Look real quick if you want to. Deuteronomy chapter 27 with me. And just read one verse here. It says, cursed is the one who lies with his father's wife because he has uncovered his father's bed. So you go back in, into the Levitical law, and it, it wasn't something that was done then. They brought it into the church. Now you have these, these pagans, these Gentiles that are coming to know the Lord and, and bring, having practices that even they wouldn't do outside of the church. And they're puffed up about it. He says the sexual immorality... Um, that even the Gentiles won't do. In verse 2, it says, And you were puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. We're puffed up about it. Sometimes Christians, in, in the intent to be gracious and to pour out grace on others, will accept things that they shouldn't ought to, will overlook things and not deal with things that the scriptures tell us clearly are wrong. Now, we always keep in mind that when we do this, we speak the truth in love, as Jesus told us, right? And have that spirit of love, not to shame, not to condemn, but to deal with it. Paul says, you're puffed up because you're just saying, well, look how gracious we are that we'll, you know, we don't care. Do what you want to. It's all good. And we see that so often in so many different ways in the world today, in the church today, where churches are so afraid to address issues as being sinful. Things that the, the scriptures clearly call sinful. Adultery, fornication, stealing, lying, all kinds of different things that the Bible clearly calls sin, and we're afraid to do that, afraid to deal with it. 
Jesus loves a person as they are, but thank God that he loves us enough not to leave us the way that we are. How many of you think it'd be a great thing that, that if the day you gave your life to the Lord, he said, that's it, that's great, and just left you just like that? I'm, for one, am very grateful that he did not do that with me. Because it was good to be saved, but it's better to be sanctified. It's better to walk with the Lord. It's better to be delivered from those things to grow in the Lord. Thank God that he has not left us the same as we are. The Bible tells us in Romans not to use grace as a license to sin. Say, well, you know what? It's all covered in grace, so why not just go for it? As some people have the idea, some people have the notions. Well, we're saved, and you can't take that away from me, so I'll just go do whatever I want to. Well, maybe, maybe not. You have to look at somebody, and if we look at, at the book of, of 1 John, a very good litmus test, it says, hey, if you live like this, you might not be saved. You might want to check your heart. You might want to see if you really do have a relationship with the Lord. Have you got all these different things in there? You can go look at it yourself later on. First John, boy, you want to check it out? Here you go. Am I saved? Yeah, okay. He says, we tell you these, I tell you these things so that you might know that you're saved. But in that, there's a list of things that says, hey, you know what? If you say you love the Lord and don't love your brother, the love of God is not in you and you don't know him. I like it when the Bible gets real straightforward and direct like that, don't you? You know, there's, there's not a whole lot of gray area anywhere in there at all. You got issues with people, especially with brothers, especially with Christians, and you say you love the Lord, the love of the Lord's not in you and you don't know Him. That's pretty plain. It's pretty simple. We come and, and we, we deal with these things. He says you're puffed up about how gracious you are, gracious you are rather than mourning that this is going on. The first thing that we ought to have as our response to, to people who say that they're believers that are dealing with issues in their life, that, that have sinful things in their life, is, is a sorrow for them, for the thing that's going on in their life, that there's a separation between them and the Lord, that that fellowship is not what it ought to be that they're not enjoying the peace and the blessing in their life that they should. Not be puffed up, oh, we're so gracious, we do any, anything goes, kind of thing. He said you should be mourning about this, that this one might be taken away from you. Paul says there, well, the Lord says to us to come just the way we are, but he doesn't say just to stay the way that you come. The church doors should be open to anyone who will come. Jesus says anyone who will come can come, right? But once, once you come, we should come around them to teach them, to train them up, to guide them in the way that they should go so that they can enjoy that fellowship, that relationship with the Lord that they ought to. Come the way you are, but don't stay the way that you are when you get there. Let the Lord do His work. Be transformed. Look over at Colossians chapter 3 with me. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. <clears throat> it says, Therefore, put to death your your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these things, anger, wrath, Malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his old deeds. It says, put these things down, get rid of these things, don't try to keep them. 
Don't try to drag them into this relationship with you. People talk about other people and getting in a relationship with somebody that's got a lot of baggage, right? Heard that term? Yeah, they got a lot of baggage. Well, you know what? You can either decide not to deal with them or say, you know what? Let me help you do, take care of this baggage, this stuff. The Lord says, hey, you know what? You're saved. You're different now. He says, you used to walk in these things, but now there's a change. There's a transformation. Put these things to death. Let them go. Get rid of them. Don't let these be the things that define who you are. These things in this list that's in there are often the things that people see as characteristics of themselves or others. Don't let these things be your character or your characteristics. Put these things down. He goes on to say, um, verse 9 again, he says, Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Put that old man off. And verse 10, put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Put on that new man. April and I went down to, uh, um, what's that place called down there? Picacho. And we were camping out down there. We had a great time sitting around the fire and all that stuff. And, and as you sit around the fire, you get that smoke. You know, it's, wherever you go, it's there. And, and it kind of permeates everything, doesn't it? You know, I come Thanksgiving Day, I smelt like a smoked turkey. Man, maybe I was, I don't know. <laughs> you, you get that, and, and that kind of permeates that. So what do you do with that? Well, okay, I'm just going to smell like a smoked turkey. You know, you, when we got home, you know, you go and you, and you, you take a shower and you get a little extra soap and scrub a little bit longer and a little bit harder and you get that off and you take those old clothes and, and you don't just put them back on. You take them, you throw them in a clothes hamper and put them in the washing machine and you change your clothes. You put off that old stuff, don't you? That still has that, that smoke to it, that, that flavor, that aroma of that. He says, as a believer, as a new person, as a new creature in Christ, don't be puffed up about the, the sin that controlled your life that used to define you. Put those things off and put on this new creature in Christ Jesus, whom you have from the knowledge of him. Not just knowing about him, but knowing him, the relational knowledge of him. And be changed, be transformed, the Bible tells us into the image of him. Put off that old stuff and put on the new so you can, you can grow in the Lord, be changed. Look over real quickly, back over in 1 Corinthians. Stop before you get back to 5 at chapter 6, verse 11. Has a similar thing. We'll look at it a little bit deeper when we get to that, about those old things of the flesh. In verse 11, and he says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Such were some of you. There's a change, a transformation, and something that needs to occur. This man coming into the church here at Corinth, who's got his father's wife, and got this thing coming in. He said, yeah, I want to be a believer. I want to be part of the church. And they're there in the church to say, well, we're so full of grace and everything like that. You can even do this hanging around with us. And instead of mourning the fact that this, this guy's misled and off on the wrong track, him and her, they're puffed up about it. Instead of coming and saying, hey, you know what? This is, is wrong and everything. And we're here to help you put off this old and put on the new. If you are saved, you are washed. You have been washed by the blood of Christ. And these things no longer have control in your life. The bondage to sin is broken and you're free. Don't continue in this. Learn and grow. Matthew, um, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, the Great Commission, it says, As you go into the world... Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to follow the commandments. 
Part of making disciples is teaching them to follow the commandments and teaching, to do it, teaching them to do it out of their love for Jesus Christ. Not because we don't like what you're doing and you can't be part of our club if you don't change your ways, but so that you can grow in your relationship with him and enjoy the blessings of that, the peace and the joy that come from that. And you have to come alongside. It didn't say just go out there and get people to say a sinner's prayer and accept Jesus Christ. It says to come and teach them. Some people are slower learners than others. Come and teach them. And by teaching is to show them. Teaching, to be a, a teacher, you have to have a lot of patience. To go over things over and over again and to work with them and stick with them and show them and explain it and do your best to get those students to open their eyes and understand what's going on. As a believer, it's to open your heart and let the Lord do his work in your life. Teach them. But in order to teach them, you have to know it. You can't teach somebody to do something you don't know how to do. It doesn't work. You can give them information about doing something you don't know how to do, but you can't teach them to do something you don't know how to do. Because the ultimate thing is a hands-on. All right, now show that you got this. Show that you can do it. Teaching them. Growing them up in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 4, if you go there and look at that, that whole first chapter, that whole first chapter is about what the Lord's done and how we ought to, as believers, grow up. Grow up in the Lord. Paul was dealing with the church here at Corinth and said, yeah, you know, you were a new church, but you've been around for a little while. You, you've got the Word, you've got the gifts of the Holy Spirit working and all that. You have Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. It's time to start growing up. And dealing with things in the way that you ought to. A lot of times for Christians, we need to grow up some, don't we? We have to grow up in the Lord. There's a lot of times where you run across people that are believers and you ask them, how long have you been saved? And they say 627 years. And you go, wow, why are you still sucking your thumb? You know, part of that is because they have not been taught. They have not been exhorted. They've not been lifted up. They've not been grown up. Imagine taking a child, and when they reach the ripe old age of two years old, you stop teaching them stuff. What do you think their life's going to be like when they're 20? Who's going to change their diaper? <laughs> you don't just stop. You keep teaching so that they keep on growing. Somebody that might have these issues of sin in their life can come into the church, can get saved, but don't leave them where they're at. Help them to grow in the Lord by coming alongside and teaching them. Ephesians says, grow up. The Lord supplied you with everything you need. Now grow up in the Lord. And it's our job as believers who may be a little older in the Lord, a little more mature in the Lord in our walk with Him, to come alongside those that are not and not just say oh well look at you and what you're doing but come alongside and to teach them paul says don't just be puffed up about it deal with it verse 3 says for indeed as absent in the body but present in the spirit i have already judged as though i were present him who has done this deed in the name of the lord jesus christ when you are gathered together along with my spirit with the power of our lord jesus christ deliver such a one to satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the lord that sounds kind of harsh doesn't it hey you know what if you've been dealing with this guy if you've been coming along with him if you've not just been sitting there being puffed up to how gracious you are if you're mourning this and dealing with it and he's still not coming along, he's still not growing, and he says, hey, you know what, forget it, I want to live this way no matter what, then deal with it. There comes a time that these things where, where as you're trying to teach someone and grow, and grow them up, 
where you've offered them every opportunity and they say, I don't want it. You know, you know how kids get sometimes. Maybe you still get that way yourself sometimes. I, I know, I don't want to. I just don't want to do it that way. I'm going to do it my way. Then he says to deal with them. Hey, this guy, you know, if, he, if he's there and you know and you've been trying to help him and everything and he's not coming along, deal with it. Turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the, of the flesh. Some translations will say the destruction of the fleshly desires, the sinfulness and all that stuff. Others say the destruction of the flesh. And you can figure out which one you think it is. So that they might be saved. It's not an issue of the salvation. It's an issue of the walk with the Lord. And whether or not you're willing to deal with it. it. says deal with them in the way that Jesus would. Okay, this is important, isn't it? Remember them bracelets? What would Jesus do? They're pretty good. It's a pretty good idea. Stop and say, you know what, Lord, what would you do? How would you handle this? How would you have me deal with this? To deal with these things in the way that, that Jesus did. And it's always good for us to stop and say, all right, Lord, remind me in my life how you've dealt with me when I had issues going on, when there was sin in my life that I didn't particularly want to go because we've all been there. You can all think of something, can't you? Lord, how have you dealt with me in these things, in these situations? Patiently? Lovingly? Instructing? Correcting? Chastening at times? But never forsaking? Never shaming? Never beating down, but always seeking to lift up and to build up? Look over at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, and we'll start with verse 15. It says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth, <clears throat> by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Kind of gives us some steps to follow there, doesn't it? If we look at this, we can see it in our own lives how the Lord's kind of done some of these things with us in our lives. The first thing that we get when we're not doing what we ought to be, when we've got sin in our life that we're hanging on to, is that personal conviction. The Lord's saying, are you sure you want to do that? You shouldn't do that. That conviction that we have. And then the Lord has a way of kind of bringing those things to the surface. And hopefully we have brothers or sisters that will come alongside us and say, hey man, are you sure you're on the right track here? Or maybe point out where, where, where we ought to put this down and take up this to follow the Lord to come alongside and to straighten us out, to help us to learn. And if they're still not willing, if you still don't want to hear it, then you get a, a, a group of people. There's, a, there's a, a wonderful thing in accountability, isn't there? We usually like accountability when we can gather a person or two around us that will always agree with us. I'll be accountable to you. But when there's people that are willing to spot and deal with and talk about the things that are wrong in our life and say, hey man, maybe you don't realize this, but let me show you here what the Word of God says and let me see if we can grow through this to come alongside. Also, when it's that personal conflict between two people, if somebody does something and you don't like it, Maybe it's a sin against you. Maybe it's not. Usually it's a misunderstanding. You throw James in there. It says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Because the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of, of God in anyone. 
You go to somebody that's done something wrong against you or, or whatever, and you go to them first privately. It's always an important point there. Go to them first privately. You get those situations where somebody says, Okay, brother, I'm coming to you, and I'm coming to you personally. I've asked everyone else in the church what I ought to do about this, and they said I need to talk to you. That's not what that means. Go to there and start there. If somebody does something to you, or you notice something, you find out something, you know something that, that a brother or sister might be struggling with an issue, go to them first and talk to them about it. And say, hey, man, let me come and help with this. Sometimes when it's those personal issues where they're, you know, uh, between one another, where maybe they've done something wrong, they've hurt you, maybe you're, it's a misunderstanding. It's a good way to get that straightened out. But where they, they've got something going on in, in their lives, you come, along, come to them to come alongside them, and they don't want to hear it. And they look at you and say, you know what, you're nuts, get out of here. And you say, man, I, I know I'm not that nuts, but we need to deal with this. Then it's when you bring a couple other people and say, hey, you know what? We're all seeing this. The three of us are seeing this in your life, and we really want to help you. We really want to come si alongside and deal with it. And then it says, if that doesn't work, to take it to the church. Now, that doesn't mean come up here on Sunday morning and say, Danny, I've got an announcement that I want to make. That's when you come here. When you come to the pastor, you come to the elders and say, hey, guys, we've gone and we've done and we've talked and, and everything, and there's a situation that we need to deal with. And then it, you embrace that person and say, let us help you. Let us come alongside. Let us work through this. Let us teach you. Let us love you and exhort you and build you up. And then when they refuse that, if they do, then it says, you know, if, if you're not willing to, to, to come and let the Lord do the work in your life, if you're not willing to put this down, then you need to go and go back out there and, and tell, tell you're ready. But Jesus says, and he says this in this last part, and it's very important that we catch this and that we understand this and mostly that we practice this. It says when that person, if you have to take, the, take it to that point where you say, you know, we've done everything you can and everything, and we just can't have this going on without dealing with it. Then it says to put them out, and it says to treat them like a heathen and a tax collector. What do you do with them? You throw rocks at them, right? No. You act towards that individual as if they do not know the Lord. And what do you do with somebody that doesn't know the Lord? You show the love and the grace and the mercy of, of Christ. You say, hey, you know what? You need to come to know the Lord, man. You need to give up this stuff of the world and come and know Jesus. The heathen and the tax collector. Jesus went by the tax collectors, Matthew. And he said, hey, Matthew, come on, man. And Matthew got up and left. Jesus didn't walk by like the Pharisees did and grab their robe and their garments and everything like that and walk by, oops, can't touch you, you're unclean, got to get away from this. Jesus called them out of their sin to come and join him and walk with him. You have the situation where this person who thinks they're saved has got something going on in their life, some sin in their life that they don't want to or don't know how to put down and get rid of. And for whatever reasons, a lack of, of knowledge, a lack of teaching, a lack of exhortation by other believers that they, they've not grown up enough to let go of this or they're stubborn and hard-headed as some people often can be and they refuse to do what they know is right how many times have you had somebody tell you yeah I know that's right but I'm just not ready to let go of this well okay then when you get done you know go out there and do what you're going to do when you get done and you know, when you finally run smack dab into that wall right there and you fall to pieces and everything, then call. You know, we'll come help you pick them up. So Jesus walked by to those heathens, those tax collectors, the Pharisees, says, 
What do you want to hang out with him for? He hangs out with them. But he didn't go into their sin and join them. He didn't say, hey, Matt, slide over. Let me try collecting some of those taxes. Two for the government, two for me. He said, come on. He called them out. You treat them like that, that heathen, that tax collector, like an unbeliever, someone who needs to know the love of Jesus Christ. He said, you know what? You, you've chosen this lifestyle. I can't, I, I can't say whether you're saved or not. I'm going to treat you as if you're not. He says to deal with them in such a way as that. Treat them like Jesus does. Love calls a person out of that sinful lifestyle. Back over in 1 Corinthians. It says your glorying in verse 6 there is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? We all know what leaven is, yeast, right? A little bit of yeast in something and if next thing you know you got a whole big old thing of flour there. And it all corrupts everything. It affects everything. A little bit of sin in your life will affect every part of your life. A little bit of turning your back to the sinful things in, a, in, in, the, in the fellowship will affect the whole fellowship. And it's not in that harsh, shameful kind of way, but that be if you ignore something, say, well, you know, I'm kind of don't want to deal with this. If you ignore something and you won't come alongside them to help them to grow, then that's going to affect the fellowship. It's going to affect the church. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. So verse 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Purge out the leaven. And this didn't throw out people without giving them a chance. We could hang a sign out there on our, our marquee thing out there and says only the godly can come. You'd have to find a new preacher. Only the godly can come. Only the righteous can come. Where would we be? Who would be left? We can't think just because we're a little more grown, a little bit more mature in our walk with the Lord is, is a little better than someone else's or a little different than someone else's that we can't, you know what, we don't, we don't want to mess with you guys. We want to welcome them and grow them and teach them up. The best way to purge out the leaven is to come alongside the brother or the sister that may not understand what they're doing in their life is not the way to go. People that may not understand that what's going on in their life may be sin. Maybe they've not grown. Maybe they've not heard that yet. Maybe they've not been taught that in the Word. To purge it out is to purify like that. We do ourselves. We, we say to the Lord, Lord, put me in that refining fire. When's the last time you prayed that? Not often enough. Lord, put me in the fire. Huh? Because the fire is not always comfortable. Because we don't always remember that the purpose of the fire is to purge off the dross so that we can reflect the image of the master that much more. What do you want to do? Be comfortable or reflect Jesus Christ? We come to people that, that are still learning, that are still growing, that are still dealing with the issues of the flesh in their life and everything. Graciously, lovingly come alongside them and say, come and step into the fire with me so that we, together we can be cleansed, we can be purged, and we can shine for Jesus. To come alongside those people. That's the way that you purge out the leaven. And verse 8 says, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There has to be a sincerity. That idea of the Greek word of, of sincerity was out wax, wax. And that's that statue, you know, you go over there and you, you're messing with a statue in the store and everything and you knock it over and the nose falls off. You know, and you tried to stick it back on there and they would kind of putty it in there with the wax and all that stuff. And it's like, okay, that was great. 
Well, it was, it was considered sincere if it didn't, ha didn't have anything like that going on. It doesn't have something false going on. You know, you get a car nowadays and everything. Have you ever heard of a Bondo buggy? You know, you know what that is. It, it, things been so beat up and so full of Bondo and everything like that that there's really no metal left under there. Before that, it was a lead sled because they used to use lead to do body work. It's covering up the deformities the dents, the dings in there instead of dealing with them and fixing with them. Being sincere means to be open and honest, to be real, to show these people, this person that's dealing with this sin in their life and everything, that, hey, you know what? I hear you, man. I know what it's like to have issues, to have sin that, that, that keeps nagging at you, that keeps trying to control you. I know how difficult it can be to know that you're free from the bondage of sin and to walk away from it. Because there's not a one of us that hasn't had that struggle or a one of us that doesn't have that struggle. And so we say, let me come alongside you in sincerity. Say, you know what, brother? I ain't perfect either, but let's grow together. I tell you what, it, it, it's kind of kind of a two-sided coin here yesterday with the men's breakfast. It's great when we all get together, but it, it, it was good for me to, to sit around with, with, with Don and with Gene and to listen to these men that have been walking with the Lord for so long and see the joy in their life because of it. And just to hang out with them. The hope and the peace that comes from that, from just being together and knowing that these guys are, are no different than me. but they've been walking with the Lord longer. And they can say, hey, you know what? Watch your step right over there. Tripped me up twice. Go around that, man. That idea of being sincere and truth. We sometimes have a hard time with truth, don't we? When we read the Word of God and the truth of God's Word sometimes convicts us, our hearts, and shows us that we need got something in our life that we need to deal with. And we kind of want to go, well, does that really mean that, that I can't do this or that I shouldn't do this or that I need to put this down? Does that really mean that I need to take this up? Because part of the problem that we have as Christians, as believers, is not always the putting down the old, but picking up the new. The life of Christ. The conviction to follow and the saying, I, the, the, the conviction to say, I will live righteously. I will follow Jesus. Though none go with me, I will follow him. The conviction to do that, the truth, the truth in our own lives. And then to have a situation where we need to go and be honestly, sincerely truthful with somebody else. How many times have you steered away from something or maybe watered it down, sugar-coated it, or put it in just a, some other, tried to package some truth in such a way that it's a little bit more tolerable for somebody because you were afraid of hurting their feelings? Well, I didn't want to hurt their feelings, so I didn't say anything, but, you know. Well, the, the, the heart in that is right, but the actions are not. Bible tells us, speak the truth in love. Say, you know what, you know what, you know I love you, you know I care about you and everything like that. And I got to tell you this, let's see what the Bible says. And when you do that, when you come alongside someone where there's that, that to point out something that they may not know, that they may not understand, make sure that you got your Bible right there to back it up. Look at what the Word of God says, let me teach you. Hear this from the Word of God, not from me. Sincerity and truthfulness. The truth of the Word of God. Don't sugarcoat it. You know, I, I sometimes pick on that cross. I like that cross. It's a beautiful thing. But it's a lousy depiction of the cross that Jesus died on. But it's also shows us what we do sometimes as believers. 
we polish the cross so that it's attractive. It was a rugged, brutal, bloody, horrifying death that Jesus died on a cross for us. You look at that and understand that he did that because of our sin. And sometimes it's hard for us to go to someone who says they're a brother or sister and may not know that needs to learn, that needs help in growing, and saying, what you're doing is sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. He died on that cross, that bloody, brutal death for what you're doing. Love him enough to put that down and take up the love of Christ and walk with him. The truth is sometimes hard and sometimes harsh. And it's difficult for us, even in our own lives, to really grasp the reality. I killed Jesus. Because he died for my sin. Be sincere. Be loving. Come alongside. Teach people to follow the commandments. And remember, Jesus says, if you love me with the love that he loved us, with the love that went to that cross and died for us, if you love me, keep my commandments. And it's all done out of love. And there's nothing that changes a life better than the love of Christ. The sincere, truthful love of Christ. Come alongside one another and purge out the leaven. Amen? Father, we come to you this afternoon, today, this afternoon, and we pray, Lord. We pray that you would search our hearts, Lord, because there's a little leaven left in each and every one of us. We're not there yet. There's still dross, Lord, that needs to be purged, that needs to be drawn off. We ask you, Lord, to search our hearts, to put us back in the fire, to refine us, to purify us, so that we might reflect you more clearly, so that we might show the love of Christ, the love that went to the cross and died in our place to those that so desperately need it, that we might see it ourselves. And, Lord, that that love is still the same for us. Let us come alongside one another so that we can grow and lift up and exhort Not to shame or to hurt or to destroy, but to build up, to lift up, and to grow up in the love of Christ. That the world out there, those heathens, those tax collectors, might see the love that we have for one another and know that we're your disciples and by that come to you and find peace, find salvation, find life. Jesus, we pray these things.